you. Yay. Thank you. Awesome. So we're recording. All right. So Brandon, can we um, just have a quick intro for you? Um, your kind of your origins of your like ghost hunting experience, what got you in the door and um, what got you curious about it? Absolutely. So my name is Brandon Alvis. I am the current paranormal technician of Ghost Hunters, the TV show on A&E. Uh, but my interest in the paranormal began at a very young age. In 1995, I lost my oldest brother to cancer. And in 2004, I lost another brother to suicide. And that kind of sent me on my journey into the unexplained and trying to find proof of a possible existence of life after death. So it was never really about having a paranormal experience per se. It was more about having to learn and learn about death at a very young age and grow up very quickly. And so I started to think about the possible existence of life after death. So I started to read as much literature as possible associated with ghosts and hauntings, you know, everything from psychic phenomena, the spiritualist movement in the 1800s, uh, to scientific investigation. And before I ever stepped foot out in the field in 2006, I started reaching out to medical doctors, scientists, um, engineers, people that could help me remain grounded in scientific principle and trying to investigate the paranormal from the scientific mindset and scientific principle. And I started an organization in 2006 called the American Paranormal Research Association. And I've been you know, researching about 16 years now, and uh, it's been quite a ride. It's been quite a ride. Wow. That's awesome. That, that like lead, leaded me in directly into this other question. So with your ghost hunting um, passion, there's kind of like a side of being spiritual and how religion comes into play with um, investigating spirits. How, what is your connection to, I guess, religion, if you have any um, with the ghost hunting space? You know, I'm not religious per se. You know, I have my own, my own belief system when it comes to the oh. afterlife. And, and what I believe happens, I wouldn't say it's necessarily uh, one religion, you know, but uh, I will say I've always been of the mindset of Einstein's theory that energy is neither created nor destroyed. And yeah. our body is made up of energy, right? We're firing off neurons in our brain. There's a lot of energy within us. The question is, where does that energy go when we die? And does it retain, retain consciousness? And that's really my focus. And that's always been you know, a big part of my research and my belief system. I completely agree with that. That's always been my thing ever since like high school when I learned that little phrase. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a big part of it. Yeah. I have a question. Since you mentioned Einstein's theory, is there any other scientific principles you help ground your paranormal investigations in? Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, I work with a man named Dr. Harry Clore, and he's the only person in history to receive two PhDs simultaneously in any discipline. And he received those in physics and chemistry from Purdue University. And him and I have been working together for over 10 years um, within trying to use scientific principle in paranormal investigation. Uh, but one thing that I've actually introduced into the new season of Ghost Hunters was based off of a theory that I had with Dr. Clore, where we brought in a camera that's called an electron multiplying camera. And this camera is typically used by the digital imaging scientific community to record single photon events, right? So photon events are light events, and these light events do carry electromagnetic radiation. And uh, some people can actually see these events with their own eye. Typically, most people don't, but there are a select few people in the world that have an extra protein in their eye that allows them to see these, uh, these single photon events. But the really cool thing about it is that we implemented this new piece of technology, this very uh, sensitive scientific piece of equipment, because we based a theory that if ghosts are real, they are manifesting from the scientific space, how would that happen? What's the mechanics behind it? And we thought, hey, it might be photons. And we utilize this camera. We put that camera out into uh, the field and we've collected some amazing, amazing data and evidence. And I think it's really helped us go that extra step further with bringing the scientific principle into investigating. And now we have a very particular matter that we're recording that we have no explanation for that could possibly be how entities and ghosts manifest. On, on that, um, I saw actually that uh, recently there was an article about you capturing like um, something on camera. Was that using that same, um, what is it, the electron multiple, what did you call it again? I'm electron sorry. multiplying camera, yeah, that's it. And uh, a lot of people say it's a huge breakthrough, which we know it's a huge breakthrough in this field because we have implemented a very sensitive scientific piece of equipment. And again, we've recorded particular matter. 
that is known within the scientific community, you know, mainly in, you know, observing space and within our own world as well, photon events. And we captured something that we can't explain, nor our scientific consultants can explain. And it behaves in a manner that no one can explain. And it also shows up in what looks like a humanoid shape. So it goes even further into the idea that if ghosts are real, um, how are they manifesting? What's the mechanics? And I think that we've made a huge breakthrough in saying that, look, hey, there's something to these photon events and that may be how entities are working in our space. Really would cool. you say, I'm just curious, would you say <clears throat> with like, as time goes on, when technology gets released and new things are innovated, it, obviously does that help you encounter ghosts? And if so, is there anything like, in the ghost hunting community that you can think of that you were like missing that you wish could be invented to like help you? You know, I think this electron multiplying camera is a huge piece of the puzzle now. Uh, but just to go further is the thing about investigating in the paranormal and what's you know typically done wrong. And from my opinion, again, there's no experts in this field in any way, shape or form, as we all know, but there's a lot of work being done out there that people see on the TV shows that just aren't, aren't sound and aren't uh, the way people should conduct themselves. The methodology is wrong, there's no protocol, and they're using devices that are made to find what they believe to be ghosts, which is the wrong thing to do if you're trying to find factual data and empirical evidence. But I think this electron multiplying camera is a huge step because now we have a very particular matter, just as I mentioned, that may be the cause for what people perceive to be ghosts. But on top of that, you have to go even further, recording the environmental conditions, humidity, temperature, pressure, EMF. Um, go and look at you know, the solar, solar flares, look at a moon phase, tide charts, things of all that, all that. So you have to really be mindful of that methodology and that protocol and trying to find as much data as possible to see what the conditions are surrounding what people perceive, perceive to be ghostly events. What, going off of like you said, some people aren't following the protocol and maybe it's misconstruing the information to an audience on like a show. What's the most common mistake that you kind of try to catch yourself from doing and you see others from maybe doing that could lead to that? Well, the biggest thing is going in and using these devices that we refer to as garage tech, right? These devices that are made to try and find ghosts, like for instance, the spirit box or the SLS camera. These devices are made to try and find ghosts. And the problem with that is, is you're going in and you're using devices that are contaminated. So if you're trying to find EVP, electronic voice phenomena, you want to be using the highest quality recording devices you can get your hands on, the highest bit rates, the best wave recordings you can. And then you can have that information tested by spectrum analysis, by an audio engineer, and be able to break all that information down to say, hey, look, this isn't a stray radio frequency. It's not a stray cell phone frequency. It's not a frequency that's man-made or within our space. Uh, the thing about the spirit box is you're scanning radio frequencies. So right off the bat, it's contaminated because you are picking up on these radio frequencies, which are a bandwidth of people projecting their voices for people to listen to on radio. So that's a big problem when people are going in and believing so much that they're using the, these devices to kind of fulfill their own prophecy if you will and it's not giving them factual data or empirical evidence it's just you know it's giving them very contaminated information that's can't really be used in my opinion right my the first thing that popped in my head is the more like i would say in a way accessible tools for like people maybe who aren't as like gun ho ghost hunters like the ouija boards and pendulums do you think that those types of tools are more led by their own like desire just to find the information they want do you think it's yes. kind of just the subconscious like guiding them along absolutely absolutely but again like there's a lot of misconception about ouija boards as well and a lot of people say they're evil and all this different stuff i'll tell you there's nothing evil made by parker brothers i'll put it that way <laughs> at first but second off you know when you go into a situation like that Conducting a Ouija board session is no different than taking an audio recorder into a place and asking questions. It's literally the same thing. It's mm. just different medium, right? It's the same exact thing. Uh, but yeah, no, I think a lot of times people want to believe so much that uh, they utilize these different techniques that's going to give them the results they're looking for. And that's a biased investigation, which is if you want to do it for your own belief system, you want to do it uh, for your own entertainment, like I call them, uh, there's a difference between a paranormal researcher and then a paratourist is what I call them. People that like to go to 
holiday locations and have fun on the weekend with their friends and whatnot. But if you're trying to further this field, you have to utilize devices from other technical industries. Utilize that to find factual information and empirical evidence that can be tested by those technical industries. Definitely, thank you. Is there an opportunity for people to find out things about the paranormal when they don't have access to this technology? Like, will they still be able to find like valid discoveries? Or is the technology? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you can go as simple as using a compass to find EMF fields. I mean, you don't have to spend a lot of money to find good information or to find, you know, um, you know, something that you can't explain, which would therefore be paranormal above the normal. So you can use, you know, compasses, you could use, you know, digital uh, audio recorders, which are very accessible and very cheap. I mean, everyone has a, a cell phone and a laptop these days. Take your cell phone, put it on airplane mode so you don't get any contamination. You got a video camera, an audio recorder right there. So uh, there's a lot of different devices you can use that's not just, you know, this really technical equipment from these other industries. Sweet. Thank you. Katarina, do you have a question? Yeah, okay, so my son, he's back there, he'll probably kill me for asking this, but so he's been talking about aliens lately and relating them to, what did you say, honey? Marley. Okay. He said something about how aliens are ghosts and like Bigfoot and he thinks he's like no they are they like he didn't say they told him but he's like oh yeah no they are I know this. and I like have you heard anything like that before because it kind of was like oh. I have yeah yeah there's a lot of theories out there that you know you talk about aliens and there's the extraterrestrial side of that and then there's the interdimensional side of that which people claim to be aliens are ghosts or entities from other dimensions not from space right they're they're in from different you know timelines that are kind of intercepting in one place which is kind of it's all theory it's all kind of far-fetched i never really am into the ufo or cryptid side of stuff i've always been ghosts and hauntings but i very much have heard theories like that where it's not extraterrestrial it's not you know little green men in a spaceship that it's right. interdimensional and that they're just somehow intersecting with our space and time and that's what people perceive to be aliens or bigfoot whatever it may be so i've heard that before yeah okay yeah he said it to me and i was like huh that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that agree with them that's for sure <laughs> i know i was like oh, okay <laughs> um how long so you said you got into this field was it uh 2006 you said that's when i started actively uh field research and i've been doing this about 16 years now but uh once i stepped foot in the field it was in 06 and actually went out and started conducting field investigations and collecting data okay and how long have you been with ghost hunters uh, this is, uh, it's been over a year now. We're on our second season, uh, which is actually airing tonight, 9 p.m. on a &E. But uh, yeah, we're on our second season now. I've been working with them over a year and it's been awesome. It's been such a great platform because I never wanted to be on TV. It's never been my goal in any way, shape or mm -hmm. form. Uh, so when they initially contacted me, my biggest question to them was, do I get to conduct the same research I've always conducted? And they said, absolutely. And that's what made me join the show because it's almost like uh, being in academia and getting a grant, right? And having that platform where you get funding and these, these resources, you go out there and conduct your research on that next level, which has been awesome. So I've been very lucky. That's really cool. Do you, do you find that there's like kind of like, in the, like, how do I ask this? It's like, obviously there's a lot of people who do go tents and there's people like, like for me, like I can go on a go tent with my friends, like you said. And then there is you who even have that funding. And stuff. Is there some type of like exclusionary aspect of that? Or do you guys like all know each other as far as like people who are on TV shows and do ghost hunts? Yeah, yeah, we, we know. I know some of the people on other shows. You know, I've been on Ghost Adventures a few times in the past. Um, I've worked with Grant Wilson, who was the, the original Ghost Hunters for many years. And uh, I've met a lot of these guys, but uh, we don't work with each other a lot unless it's at an event, which happens from time to time. But uh, because of the, the network walls that are built so high, it's yeah. tough for us mm -hmm. to, to interact with each other on that basis. But uh, yeah, once we do events every once in a while, public appearances and whatnot, where we do work with each other in that capacity. Cool. How did um, Ghost Hunters reach out to you? How do you, do you know how they found you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had friends that were on the original Ghost Hunters show, as well yeah. as Ghost Hunters International. And uh, they were starting to do the new version of Ghost Hunters, and they, they gave them my information and reached out to me. And uh, they said that they wanted me to come in and bring that scientific side to the investigations, which has always been something I've done for many years. And 
it's hard to take that seriously at first because it is a TV show. Uh, but after meeting with them for a couple of weeks and not only meeting with Pilgrim Films, which produces the show, but meeting with A&E, they, it was uh, pretty clear that they really wanted that scientific side and they wanted real factual research, not just a TV show, which was, you know, a breath of fresh air, for sure. Uh, now, go I'm just, um, I'm or, or Javari, go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I was just curious, how do you find, like, members of the Ghost Hunters community? Like, is there a Facebook group? Is there, like, a Reddit forum? Like, how do you find oh, yeah. each other? All of the above. I mean, with the, uh, with, the internet and, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all that stuff, there's millions of people out there that are into the paranormal. So there's a lot of that, you know, people make their own YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff like that, and kind of put their information out there. So it's really easy to connect with everybody. Uh, but with the team we have now for Ghost Hunters, they were found by Pilgrim Films uh, in a nationwide search for investigators, and they wanted serious investigators, you know, people that brought something to the table in some capacity, you know, and each one of us brings something different and unique. And what you're seeing on the new season, which is really exciting, is that you're seeing that we're meshing together now. We've really been working together for over a year, and you see that evolution of the team and uh, what everyone brings to the table is, is pretty cool. How do you successfully like foster a good team unit? Um, especially like the first season, you kind of all, you know, I watched the, the uh, pilot and you kind of all were meeting each other. Some of you knew each other. Um, but how do you build that trust and make sure you're a good cohesive team? Well, the first thing that's the most important is to set a protocol and the methodology, right? And that's something that I was tasked to do being the paranormal technician of the team that I had to come in and show these guys the way we were going to, going to investigate the paranormal by starting on earth, getting in and trying to find a natural explanation first. Mm -hmm. And if we don't find a natural explanation, we try and collect data surrounding these eyewitness testimony, right? So these eyewitnesses, these accounts, and we go in and we do that strictly with equipment from other technical industries that help us capture this factual data and empirical evidence. And once we find something we can't explain, we step forward by taking that to a scientific consultant or a consultant that, that knows all about the device we're using or all about the information we're collecting. And that was something that a lot of the people on Ghost Hunters weren't doing before. Uh, they would just go in, investigate, you know, your run of the mill investigations, but they never really took it that extra step by trying to really remain grounded in scientific principle and reaching out to these consultants. And uh, over that year of teaching these guys that way, it just, it became natural to them. You know, it became, you know, second nature. And now it's, they want to find logical reasons more than finding ghosts, which is always really exciting. <laughs> that is, what is your favorite, um, like type of spirit? Like when you encounter a poltergeist, a shadow, which one are, are, excites you the most? All of them, all of the above, because if I find something I can't explain and then I take that to one of our consultants and they can't explain it either, that's a, always a big win for us. And then, because the case is never closed, you know I mean? When we find something we can't explain that we believe to be paranormal, we have to continue to look into it and try and hopefully replicate it and capture more information associated with it. So it's, uh, it's tough, but that's another step. It's funny you mentioned that, you know, the different types of hauntings and ghosts, because yeah. That's something I've been working on since 2006 and something that I'm, you know, working on another project right now that'll be out hopefully next year where you classify different types of ghosts and hauntings instead of just saying, oh, it was a shadow or it was a, or you saw a ghost. When you go to a zoo, you don't say you saw a bunch of animals. You go to a zoo and you say, I saw tigers and bears and monkeys, whatever it may be. Yeah. But the same when it comes to the paranormal. From a scientific point of view, genus and species, we should be documenting and classifying these things. And that's something I'm working on is a classification system. So that's a, one of the next projects I'll be working on within the paranormal. So that's exciting as well. Yeah, that's, that would be fantastic. What is your favorite, like, memory? Probably the most common question you get, but favorite um, interaction with any type of spirit? Oh, that had to be uh, Fort Stanton, New Mexico, which was on this current season of Ghost Hunters that aired, I think it aired last week, where we went to this amazing place that's just surrounded in history, right? From the Civil War, the Apache Wars, uh, the Lincoln County War with Billy the Kid, and then it became ground zero for the fight against tuberculosis, where they built the first federal tuberculosis hospital on that site. And it was some of the most credible eyewitnesses we've ever worked with people from the New Mexico State Park System. These are people that 
are drug tested. They have psychological evaluations. They're very credible people that claim to be having some terrifying experiences. And we went in with this electron multiplying camera and recorded something no one's ever seen. Some would call it the Holy Grail in paranormal research. And we documented that at Fort Stanton. And that's a moment I'll definitely never forget because it was such a big breakthrough. Wow. Are there like specific locations like um, Skinwalker Ranch, you know, Area 51? <laughs> I don't know if that plays into more ghosts, more so aliens, but are there like almost like seven wonders of the ghost hunting community? <laughs> Always, yeah. You know, one of those would probably be Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky, which is another, uh, another episode you'll see in this season where we return there and check that out. Yeah, but there's a lot of them. Queen Mary in Long Beach is another yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's quite a few of them. But one that's always on my list has got to be the Tower of London, which I would love to get in there in some capacity. That would be unbelievable. It'd be like a, the perfect paranormal research center, if you will. Definitely. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on, like, um, I've seen a lot of episodes that they include me. Oh, hi, I'm Clarissa, by the way. Hello. <laughs> a little later. Um about mirrors like being like the entrance to the world like my grandma like growing up like she covered all of like our tvs and stuff so that way like they couldn't um weren't facing us so i don't know if, is that like something you guys look at sure i mean that's an interesting point of view throughout different you know belief systems in, in the world that mirrors or portals or uh, doorways right and you think about the victorian era even when uh, the death culture surrounding the Victorian area where if someone passed away, they would cover all the mirrors because they wouldn't want their spirit to be trapped within the mirror. So funny enough, we actually conducted an experiment called the Psychomantium Chamber, right? That was uh, created by a man named Dr. Raymond Moody. If you guys haven't heard of this, this gentleman, look into his research. He's the man that coined the term near-death experience. So this guy is next level research. And he created this experiment called the Psychomantium Chamber where you would use uh, uh, soundproofing blankets and a mirror and you would put yourself in this extremely dark room with one bit of light behind you, soundproofed, and you would sit there and mirror gaze and stare into the mirror. And he claims in his years of research, he's had entities and spirits appear in that mirror and speak to him. So that's a really great question. That's something to look into. The Psychomantium Chamber, as well as Dr. Raymond Moody's work, with the psychomantium. That's something we actually conducted in season two of the, of the show. That's something we're always trying to do is take old pieces of research like that in different belief systems and trying to do a, a scientific study around it. So great question. Wait, what was the doctor's name? Dr. Dr. Raymond Moody. Raymond. Yeah, but yeah, that's something that my grandma always talked about. She would always have like the mirrors covered and I didn't know if that was like an actual thing or it was just something that she would do or even just like the static on the TVs. Like right. have you ever seen like, um, like the, it's always like a common thing in movies that I've always sure. connected it to horror, but like I'd never connected it to like ghost and like right. that being like. Some that's sport. another thing there's uh there's something called itc which i'm sure you guys have looked into before it's called instrumental trans communication right and uh that falls with a lot of you know different spirit box stuff and different types of research called itc instrumental trans communication but there was a man named uh carl schreiber many years ago from germany that conducted research with static and TV, just as you're mentioning, oh, wow. where he would take a camera, a tape camera, and plug that camera into the TV and do a playback loop where the lens was actually pointed at the TV, so it was just constantly looping. And uh, he collected some unbelievable images okay. that way, which that's something to look into as well. It's called the Schreiber method. So that's something to check out. So that's a big piece of ITC that I always found really interesting. Some of the images he collected are unbelievable, one of which is Albert Einstein. So that's something to look into also. It's really trippy. Cool. That's so cool. Is there any stories that you would recommend us like, watch, like documentaries or anything like that? Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. I, I always go more to the science side of it and mm -hmm. to look at it from the scientific perspective and then put your own paranormal opinion into it instead of watching a paranormal documentary per se. But uh, I know that there was a great interview that Joe Rogan did with a man named Dr. Pimrose. And Dr. Pimrose is 
a brilliant scientist and he goes into a huge section about black holes and quantum theory and he starts to talk about photons which is the particular matter we're actually documenting with this new camera and uh, the things he says about photons and the way they work within the universe really plays into the way we think ghosts may be manifesting on earth which is really interesting or what people perceive to be ghosts right it could be a very well a natural phenomenon that just hasn't been documented yet that people perceive to be ghosts so I, that's something i would look into dr Pemrose is great and there's a lot of quantum theory the double slit experiment is a great one um quantum spiral theory a bunch of stuff like that so that that really gets into the ghost realm and actually einstein even referred to uh photons as ghost particles at one time which is another interesting fact <laughs> Interesting. I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, it's fun stuff, man. The science, science and the paranormal, and science and religion, in my opinion, intersect and are one and the same. And it's really tough for really hard science people and really <laughs> tough religious people to come together in that middle ground. Yeah. But in my opinion, this might think that they're one and the same. And there was a lot of scientists throughout the years that thought that as well. Isaac Newton was one of them. Um, so was uh, uh, Nikola Tesla, believe that as well, and Albert Einstein too. So they all very much believe that science and religion were one and the same. And that's, I think, something we should look into. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting perspective. To yeah. Look into. I like the scientific side of it, too. Oh, yeah. And uh, Isaac Newton actually tried decoding the Bible through mathematics. That's how, that's how into the, the science and religion aspect he was into it. Uh, it's actually, there was a great documentary about that called The Bible Decoded, and it's all about Newton going in and mathematically taking all these Bible verses and making predictions about the future, which, some of which have became true, which is really interesting. Mm, wow. So it's something to look into. It's a really, really cool. I think History Channel produced that many years ago. It's called The Bible Decoded. It's pretty cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, anyone else have any other questions? Um, I feel like there's so much, but I don't even know where to start. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Do you believe that some people are like naturally like sentient or like sensitive to like paranormal activity? Yeah, absolutely. I think we all have that empathic ability within ourselves. Um, it just somehow we lose it along the way and some keep it and some intensify and, and amplifies for them. But everyone always has gut feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone, I'm sure everyone here in this chat room has had moments where they felt like something was going to happen and then it happened. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that's in some way empathic ability or someone called psychic or being sensitive. I like to use the term empathic because I think that everyone kind of has that within themselves and trusting your gut. So yeah, I think there are people out there that have these extra abilities. And that goes back to talking about photon events. That's another interesting scientific point where are these people that claim to be psychics that see entities and ghosts, do they have this extra protein in their eye that allows them to see these photon events? So now we're looking at that even from another standpoint, from a scientific perspective, that's even more interesting. And yet again, these photon events do carry electromagnetic radiation and you always see, you know, paranormal investigators are trying to find EMF, right? So is it these photon events that we're not being able to see until now with this electron multiplying camera? Who knows, we have to look into it further. Yeah. How do you deal with like spectic, uh, what's the word? Why am I blanking? Spectics? Like who maybe, yeah, if someone's spectic, they don't really, you know, believe it going forward, but then do they come out of it like a yeah. full-fledged believer? I'm sure the science aspect really helps dealing with those types of mindsets. Absolutely. You know, it's, you know, working with Dr. Clor for so many years, my thought about what skeptics were and what skeptics really are are completely different because if you're a skeptic and you come into a situation already not believing you're biased already so that's not really what a skeptic is and that's unfortunate there's a lot of people that call themselves skeptics that truly aren't skeptics skeptics aren't people that don't believe skeptics are people that want to see proof that it exists sure. so that's being open-minded enough to see if there's data associated with it or if there's research behind it but if you go in calling yourself a skeptic and saying, oh, I don't believe, you're, you're already dead in the water in that regard because you're already biased within the investigation. Therefore, there's no convincing someone like that. Uh, yeah, I've heard um, on, a, on a ghost hunt, I went on like the USS Hornet up in Northern oh, yeah. California. Um, and they said, we were part of like a, a bigger group 
but that group was very anti-ghost and really believe and was very honest about it up front. Um, and something happened where they had to leave. <laughs> um, and nothing happened when we were with them, but once they left, things started occurring. So I'm wondering if um, spirits can kind of feel that energy if someone's completely kind of like mocking it or closed off to the idea. Do you think it's common for them to just be like, oh, forget you, like we don't care about like showing you because you know, they don't have the attitude. <laughs> That's a great question. You know, and that's one thing that you see with our research, on, not only on the show, but what I conduct with APRA and my other organization. Mm -hmm. I am a firm believer that you receive the energy that you put out, right? So if you're going into a location and you're, you know, being loud and demanding or not believing, you're going to get that back in some way. I believe if you go in there, you're respectful, you treat them as people, and you have a respectful mindset, you're going to get a lot more information and data because you're treating them as people. So I think that you receive the energy that you put out, definitely. Sweet, yeah. What are your thoughts on like children being able to see like ghosts and like, mm -hmm. um, like in that area? Yeah, you know, children and animals as well, they say. Animals, yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think it's a strong possibility. And I, again, I think that goes back to the idea with these photon events and some people having the extra proteins in their eyes that allow them to see photons. I think we're really onto something with that. So I think that's a way for us to really look into that phenomena, not just say, oh, we can theorize and guess that they may be seeing entities, but we can actually test that and look into that in a, in a very structured way in a lab. I think that's going to be really exciting and something we should look into further, definitely. Yeah. Do you guys have any more questions? Um. Let's see, we have seven more minutes before the Zoom kicks us out because we don't have the pro account. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have a silly question. So my, not silly, but so my son wants to go on a ghost hunt. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what's the youngest kid that you've witnessed going on these kind of hunts and stuff? Is there like a age range that usually kids go on or is it kind of all throughout? Yeah, yeah, there's like all ages depending on the event. There's certain events that are 18 or old, older and whatnot. But uh, yeah, no, I, it's it's up to each person's discretion. I think that if you want to introduce kids that are young age to it, there's no problem with that. I've never been against that myself. And I've conducted a lot of fundraisers for historical societies throughout the country where we allow all ages into these investigations because not only is it interesting for them, but it's a perfect avenue for people to learn about history. Right. So some people right. actually aren't into the historical side of, of these places, these locations that are a lot of which are struggling for money that they'll come check out the paranormal. But they don't realize that when you're coming to check out the paranormal, you're getting a huge history lesson within that. And when you're investigating the paranormal, it's no better way than to relive history in a sense. And, hey, you might be actually be able to communicate with these people that you know, yeah. made the what it is, which is really exciting. Maybe I'll take them then. <laughs> <laughs> Do you do a lot of events um, like yourself, you said? I know you said that you get together with other people and hold events, but do you do ones that are specifically just run by you? Yeah, every once in a while. We did one this year already with the whole Ghost Hunters team. Uh, we did that in uh, Santa Paula, California, at the Glen Tavern Inn, which was a lot of fun. I actually lived at the Glen Tavern Inn for a number of years. It's known as one of the most haunted hotels in California, and I uh, wanted to immerse myself in what it would be like to live in a haunted place. and. I lived there for about three years and had some crazy experiences. So it was cool to not only do a public event there, uh, but to have the ghost hunters team there to check it out. So that was a lot of fun. So we do them every once in a while. And, you know, once this whole pandemic's over, I think we'll probably get back to doing them again. Yeah. We originally wanted to hopefully go on to a ghost hunt, like all of us and stuff, but then obviously the pandemic happened. So oh, yeah. <laughs> we can hopefully, do that. <laughs> hopefully soon. I know we really want to go on one. I guess my question is, um, I know you have a podcast and Christine was saying ghost hunting can usually not be a highly lucrative business. Yeah. Do you, um, what is next for you? How are you, you know, is ghost hunting your top priority for your financial needs or what does that look like for you? I've always been involved in the TV industry. I worked as a promotions producer for ABC, CBS, and Fox News for a number of years. Uh, I'm also a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, which 
I could send you guys a link to my most recent documentary. It hasn't been released yet, but I'd love to send it to you guys to check out. Just Ooh. as a thank you for talking to me. I've been going crazy in this uh, quarantine. I'm here with my fiance, my three-month-old baby. So it's uh, <laughs> so much talk you could have with a three-month-old as he is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk about yeah, no, so I'll go back to making more films and we'll see how long Ghost Hunters goes. It's a, a very recognizable franchise and uh, it's a hit TV show for a and It's Totally. People love it. So we'll see how long it goes, but always want to get back to filming, making film. And I'm, that's a huge thing for me is to try and bridge the uh, modern audience with historical events that they've never heard of. And that's what I like to do. So I've always really been influenced by Ken Burns and that type of documentary okay. filmmaking. So that's what I love to do. That's a perfect marriage for you. The documentary side, the history side, and the science background, and obviously the passion for ghosts. It's yeah, yeah, that's perfect. It works, man. Yeah. It definitely works. But yeah, yeah. I'd love to send you guys a link to that so you can check it out. It's a password protected video. It hasn't been released yet. It'll be released next year. So send that to you guys and check it out. It's a great story about uh, city government illegally demolishing a, cem a cemetery, a seven acre pioneer cemetery, mm -hmm. illegally. And uh, there's a big cover up about it. It's uh, kind of a true crime documentary, which is cool. So, yeah. very cool. Well, thank you for talking with us. It's really exciting. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Thank I know, so it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. You. Have a great day. And All right. Yeah, stay, good luck with everything. Posted in the quarantine. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> good luck with the baby. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. <laughs>